Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pod's moving and storage studio, it's The Ramsey Show, where America hangs out to have a conversation about your life and your money. I'm George Campbell, joined this hour by best-selling author and Ramsey personality, Christina Ellis, and it's a free call at 888-825-5225. You jump in, we'll talk about your life and your money. Samuel kicks us off this hour in Charlotte, North Carolina. Samuel, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. How are you going? How are you doing, man? How can we help? Doing, doing pretty good. So I guess my main question is, I'm moving out from my parents' house soon to the state of Florida. My girlfriend lives there, so we're planning to get married. And my question is, this would be my first place on my own. Would it be better to go for an apartment lease or try and do a mortgage? Because, honestly, the prices are only a couple hundred dollars difference, uh, depending on, like, a small house versus, like, a, a one-bedroom apartment. So I'm just trying to figure out the best route to get there. What's your timeline on things? So you're moving to Florida. When's that happening? You're going to marry your girlfriend. When's that happening? What's that look like? Uh, My plan is to move there sometime this spring and then get married uh, around the end of the year. Okay. So initially when you move there, you're going to be living by yourself for a while, right? Yes, exactly. Are you going to have a roommate? Uh, That's what I'm trying to figure out. Are you pretty... I'm I'm not against it, but I don't really know anyone there yet, so... We're going to see. Okay. Are you pretty familiar with the area of Florida that you're moving to? Yeah, I've been, I've visited a couple different, or probably like 10 times at least. So I do know, I do know the area pretty well. Okay. And what's your financial situation? What's your income? Yeah. So right now I, I run my own video production um, agency. Awesome. It is um, my own business, but I do have a couple like retainer clients. So it is um, sort of guaranteed income on, on contract. And so, Anywhere right now from around fifty to sixty thousand. Cool. And you would keep that business running if you moved to Florida? Is it something you can do yes. remotely? Yes. Uh most of it is remote, but I do have enough time to go out and do physical jobs around the area, that sort of stuff. Cool. Well, Samuel, this is all super exciting. Like moving out of the parents' house, getting married. This is this is awesome. How old are you? Yeah. I'm eighteen. Wow. You're a stud, dude. All right. How much debt do you have? Uh, I have no debt right now. Uh, the only payments I'm doing are just car insurance, uh, phone bills, and a couple other subscriptions, around about $300, uh, $300 a month. Cool. And then how much money do you have in the bank? Uh, right now I have around 5000 saved up, um, so not too much. That's what I'm trying to, trying to figure out. Is that just enough to get you moved and, you know, first month, last month deposits, all that kind of stuff? Yes, but okay. I do have um, a lot of gigs already signed on and contracted for this year. It's just a matter of getting it done and getting paid for it. Okay, so back to your original question, should you buy or should you rent? You should absolutely rent. And not just yeah. because you don't have money for the down payment right now, but also because we don't know the area. You're going to get married at the end of the year. So I would sign probably you know a year lease when you get over there, and you're not even engaged yet, right? No, not yet, no. But you still think you're going to propose and be married before 2023 is over? That's the plan, yes. This guy's got a lot of drive for 18. A lot of respect for Samuel. I love it. Hey, Samuel, if I'm in your shoes, that's how we often answer these questions because, you know, right now you've got a wide open space. There's so many different ways you can go. But if I'm in your shoes, I'm going to try to get as little obligation and stress as possible. So I love what George said about a roommate. I'd be looking online, you know, joining Facebook communities, maybe networking with your friends, see if they know anybody in the area, maybe your girlfriend knows, knows someone, and see if you can just be mm-hmm. a roommate to somebody who already has a lease. Like that Ooh, leaves like your it. options gotcha. open. Yeah, it just okay, it gotcha. takes kind of the stress off of it. Now, when it comes to, yeah, totally. to buying a house, you don't need a credit score, but you will need rental history. And so make sure that you have good track record of you're making a consistent monthly payment on time. You've got a few trade lines open, like you mentioned, your your cell phone bill, something you're paying consistently every single month, your internet bills, those subscriptions. They're going to be looking for things like that just to prepare you for, okay, the, for the time you are ready to buy a house. And also, like with okay, your gotcha. girlfriend, there's going to be so many factors with the home buying process. Like you're – you're going to get married eventually, right? And so she's going to have her opinions on the house. She's going to, you know, want certain wallpaper, a certain layout. And so being able to make that decision together once you're married is going to, you know, just involve her in the process. You're not going to get locked into a house that maybe, you know, in a year once you're married, she's like, I don't like this house. I want to go somewhere else. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
And when you get married, man, you. it's a lot of life change at once. So I'd even encourage you guys to rent for a year. You're probably going to need more time just to save up because you got to save up for a wedding too in the next year. Mm -hmm. And we don't know who's going to be sure, paying yeah. for what. You're going to have to buy an engagement ring. So there's a lot of life expenses coming up that I would be focused on before home ownership. You'll get there. You're going to get there way before most of America will ever get there at 18 mm -hmm. with no debt making 60K. And so I'd continue to just try to live on as little as you can for the next year as you get married and maybe you sign a lease and then she joins and you kick the roommate out. That's always a fun game yeah. to play. So that's an option as yeah. well you can think about. Well, and okay, gotcha. awesome. you're in such a great spot now. The fact that you are calling the Ramsey show at 18, you know, on the front end of all these decisions, that is awesome. And I think we get in the spot a lot of times, you know, especially when you're young, it feels like you need to hurry. Like you need to hurry. You need to get the house. You need to get married and all these different things. And I think it's awesome that you're getting married. But with some of these other things, you don't have to be in too big of a rush, right? You don't have to lock yourself okay. into a long-term mortgage. Like you can make a big step in moving to Florida, but you don't have to like have every single thing figure it out straight away. So your, your next goal, totally. Samuel, is we've got to get this move done. Let's figure out what our rent situation looks like. Then we're going to start, uh, make sure we have an emergency fund in place of three to six months of expenses, once you know what those are going gotcha. to be. Then we're going to be saving up for the engagement ring. And then we're going to be planning for the wedding and paying for that. Then once all that's over and we have a new situation in this marriage, we can then focus on saving up that down payment. And I want you to have at least 10% down. I love 20% or more because you can avoid PMI and only get a 15-year fixed rate mortgage. And it's so gotcha, easy to get okay. tempted by the 30 year and say, well, we'll pay it off like a 15 and it gives us wiggle room. I don't play that game. How about we get a 15 and pay it off like a seven. And by the time you're, you know, 27 years old, you've got a paid for house and the rest mm. of your life ahead of you with your bride. Well, and what's gotcha. beautiful too, at awesome. this age, at 18, just starting their lives, getting married, like these are your textbook baby step millionaires, right? In 15 years, y'all are going to be killing it. You're walking into your 30s with a paid off house, with a huge retirement account. Like that is your future if you follow these steps. How'd you hear about this stuff, Samuel? I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I I have a, a friend of mine who used to work at Ramsey. And so he sort of introduced me to the different things. And then um, I just started watching the YouTube videos and I was just watching it while I was eating lunch. And I'm like, I should call in and just, just see what they have to say. So I, I love, love it. I love watching the highlight videos. That's awesome, man. Well, we appreciate that. Our YouTube team especially appreciates that. Such an, an awesome vehicle to get people who may not know about us to go, oh, this stumbled upon this. And with all the just trash stuff on the internet and social media and TikTok and YouTube, we're going upstream here with some countercultural advice, which is not get rich quick. It's get rich slow. Slow down. Use wisdom. Pay cash for things. And you wouldn't believe the hate we get for just saying that basic stuff. But it's God's and Grandma's ways of handling money. It's The Ramsey Show, and you can join the conversation at 888-825-5225. And I want you to have a house, but I don't want a house to have you. That's why you need to get in touch with Churchill Mortgage to make sure you do this right. These guys are awesome. They'll help you get on a smarter mortgage plan because they're committed to doing what's right for you. That means they check in every year with free consultations to help you stay on the right plan. They show you how to save money and interest so you can build wealth faster. They walk you through the total cost of your loan so you can make the best choice. Basically, they care. That's why we call them Ramsey Trusted. You can achieve debt-free home ownership and Churchill is here to help. Go to their site, churchillmortgage.com slash Ramsey to start your approval or get more information.
Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. I'm George Camel, joined by Christina Ellis this hour. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Courtney joins us up next in Jackson, Tennessee. Courtney, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Sure. How can we help today? So I'm like super upside down on my car, and I am in baby step number two, and it's actually my highest debt. But it's just, it's causing me so much trouble. Not the vehicle, but the payment itself. It's just outrageous. So I'm trying to figure out what to do as far as, you know, my vehicle goes. How much do you owe on the car? Um, I owe about 32000 Okay. And what is it worth right now? 18000 Oof. How, how did it get to this point? What did you buy the car for? Um, after interest and stuff, it was $49,000. So you paid forty nine for it. What was it worth at the mm-hmm. time you bought it? You think it was worth forty nine? Um, I don't remember. I want to say it was like 35 or so. And, um, the interest is, I think the interest is what's like got it all messed up. What's your payment and what's your interest rate? I pay six eighty eight a month. Oof. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's rough. The What's interest the rate is twelve point. I'm sorry, fifteen point twelve percent. Why did you get such a terrible interest rate? Honestly, I'm not sure because this was the first vehicle I ever financed, and before, like after that, I got other debt. But before the car, I had like three thousand dollars in student loans, and that was like all that was on my credit. Oh my goodness! How, what's the what's the term for this? How long is the loan for? Six years. Six years. What kind of car is it? A 2018 Volkswagen Tiguan. Okay. How long have you had it? Eight months, and that's how like deep how low the value has gone in eight months. It's gone down that quickly, or do you think you bought it a little too too high priced? Maybe I bought it. You know, but I was just thinking, wow, you know, it's decreased in value, I guess. Who but sold this car to you? The dealership I worked for. No. Oh. Yeah. Was it like a, a co-worker that's a friend or, or how did that happen? Yeah, it is a friend, but I don't work in the sales department. I work in the service department, but yeah, it was a friend and I don't, I'm not sure like, you know. If they Have were you talked to, to them about this? I have. Um, what did they say? And I think that pretty much they're telling me, like, at the time, like, the market was just so messed up on cars. Do, have you had any, like, frank conversations with them, like, asking kind of, like, what was the value of the car when you sold it to me? I haven't, but that is a good idea. I'm actually on my lunch break right now, so I could do that when I go back here. There's no way that car was worth forty nine five when you bought it, which is how much you're paying with all these payments. And actually, it was like fifty five after I put the. I got. I did get all the warranties and things on it, but. How uh, long have you worked? You can return that warranty, right, and get some money back out of this. Yeah, I could return the warranty. How much would that give you back? Um, probably about maybe five thousand. Okay, and how much money do you have in the bank? Um, I have about 2000 in my checking account, and other than that, I just have $1,000 for an emergency fund. Okay. How long have you worked for this dealership? Uh, about a year now. Do you feel like, in general, they typically have pretty good integrity? Most of the time, yeah. Yeah, and and the, my coworker, he's actually a friend of mine, and, you know... My friends don't screw me over at 15%. Interest. That's what I was thinking too. Is like I feel like I've been screwed over on it, and you know, financially, that's that's a big. I want to know how much big, this guy you know, made off this deal. Yeah, probably a lot. And you know, I'm 22, so I'm not trying to be stuck in this for seven years. Ooh, was it, okay. So the 18,000 value that you say your car has, like, is that from Kelly Blue Book? Is that somebody at your mm-hmm. job that said that? KBB. Is that private party? Or trade in. Yes, that's private party. Okay, I'm gonna still do some more homework and research every single place that buys used cars, and that's online, that's local dealerships, to see how much you could get for this. Maybe even try listing it, and see if you can get more for it. 
And I, okay, this, this may not be the best advice, but <clears throat> if I'm in your shoes, I'm going to my boss and I'm saying, here's the situation. How is this car that I just bought eight months ago for this price now worth 18? And kind of walk through the situation with your coworker. Because my hope is that as your employer, there's some sliver of heart there that maybe they'll even consider buying it back from you. At close, a higher rate. Right. Closer to what you paid mm -hmm. for it. Right. Yeah. There's going to be stupid tax on this either way. The only other option yeah. here to get out from under this thing uh, soon is if you went to your local credit union and get a personal loan for 14000 to cover the difference. Right. And now you're 14000 in debt instead of 32000 in debt at a much right. lower interest and, rate. And I have other debt, but it's just – it's $7,800, and I could pay that off pretty quick but I'm thinking long term, like, oh, well, it's going to take me years to get out of debt with this car. Where's so, where the seventy eight come from? Because I thought you said you only had three thousand in debt when you got the car. Well, I had three thousand at the time, and this was a stupid decision. But after I got this car, I started started getting all these um, uh, things in the mail, like, oh, you're approved today for this and that and this and that. And at the time, I was just like, oh. Yay, extra money, and I took out a personal loan, but I've never done that again. I've learned my lesson because the interest rates on them were outrageous, and I actually um, had like a $2,000 loan that ended up being like $4,500 overall. So, Well, yeah. I, I'm assuming that you've had your I've had it moment, that you're done I've with had debt. It, yes, mm -hmm. I've had it. I'm, I'm too young to be stressing about this. I've got goals, and I'm like, no, I'm trying to get out of all this while I can. Heck yeah. Well, start ripping up your mail. And if it says 0% yeah. or if it looks like free money, run as far as you can. Because there's no yeah, such thing I, as a free I lunch. Yeah, have... there is no free money. I, <laughs> thought I learned that the hard way. They are not your friend. And by Definitely the way, this not. dealership is not your friend. Yeah, I, I've thought about that too. What are you making at this dealership? I make about 50000 a year. Okay. Do you have any credit cards right now? I don't. I actually paid. That was my number one baby step. Or in the baby step number two, the first thing I did was pay off a credit card. I owed like $288 on it. I paid it. I called. I canceled. And I, I'm out of the credit card situation. Okay. So this 50000 is that your only job? You've got one job right now? I do only have one job. I've been searching. I've been listening to y'all, and a lot of people are talking about, like, DoorDash, and I've been considering doing, like, a part-time DoorDash job, just something to get a little more money to try to pay it off faster. Yeah, you can also look into grocery delivery services like Instacart or Shipt. Um, you can even try Amazon Flex if that's in your area to deliver packages on your own schedule, and you can make some good money doing that. Well, and it's I like write that down. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. And right now with where you're at, I know you're mad that like you're in this situation at 22 years old. Like you said, you've got yeah. goals. You need to get out of this. So I want you to take that anger that you feel and that frustration and just channel all of it into doing everything you can to get rid of the stat. I want you working 60, 80 hours a week. I want you cutting back to the bare minimum, eating, you know, as cheaply as possible. Like we have got to go scorched earth on this. Yeah, for sure. And I have been. I, I've got the app that you guys uh, talk about. I've been budgeting. It's just like I was just trying to think about the long run and what I could do about my car. Well, see if the, if uh, you can talk to the dealership and go, hey, listen, you guys screwed me on this deal and I work here and that is not cool to treat an employee that way. So here's what I'm asking. Trade in this car. Give me the crappiest car on your lot to get me out of this situation. And if you need, still need to go take a small personal loan from that credit union to cover this mess and get out of this thing, then do that. And then we're attacking the rest of the debt while driving this beater car until it's all done. Yeah, I'll do that. I'm down to drive a beater car, whatever it takes to get out of Good. You know, this situation. And stand up for yourself, Courtney. Don't take crap from these guys. And I'd be leaving this dealership as soon as I'm out of this mess because I don't trust these people.
still on baby step number one, eh? How'd you guess? With healthcare costs rising, learn how Christian Healthcare Ministries can help you make the most out of your budget. Visit chministries.org slash budget. Don't worry, it's worth it. I'm George Campbell, joined by Christina Ellis this hour. This is The Ramsey Show. You can give us a call at 888-825-5225. Especially if you've got questions about college and further education and saving for college and getting out of that student loan debt. And what about student loan forgiveness? Christina is the expert on that subject and would be happy to jump in and help you with those calls. All right, Christina. So earlier this week, as I've been hosting... We covered some stupid tax moments, which is what we call, you know, financial decisions that we regret that have some zeros on the end. We read some off the internet that were funny and sad. Jade and I shared some of our own stupid tax moments, and I thought Christina is perfect. And it turns out <laughs> it's nope. a lie. You had a little stupid tax moment. I had a very good. recently, <laughs> right? So we're doing no spend month, right? We've not been spending anything aside from essentials. We've been doing it with this community, been super committed to it. So it's kind of nice because you can look at your bank account and there's not a lot of charges in there. Um, our budgeting has been super easy to do. But I got into our bank account the other day and I saw a few Amazon charges. And I was like, how can that be? We're not spending any money this month. Like what? what's going on, Amazon? So... I go into our account, and normally, this is really sad, y'all, this is kind of embarrassing to admit on air, but part of the reason for doing no spend month is because we were going a little crazy on Amazon. Like, you know, it's so easy to just get a little thing here and a little thing there, and all of a sudden you have all these Amazon tra transactions. So, you know, normally it's drag and drop, drag and drop, drag and drop. We, you know, put it in, you know, beauty category. We've got clothes, we've got all these things, and occasionally there's a charge that comes through that we don't know what it is. And, you know, my husband and I, we share budgeting duty, duty Duties, and it's easy to just go, okay, well, we'll just put that in the miscellaneous category. It's like one charge. It's 10 bucks. It's five bucks. Doesn't happen too often, but you know, it does happen sometimes. So I see these two charges come through and I'm like, I'm racking my brain. So I go to our recent orders. I'm like, thinking, I'm like, did my husband cheat on no spend month? <laughs> like, What's going on? And there's nothing in my recent orders. And I'm like, okay. So then I go like digging around in Amazon and I'm like looking for any sort of transaction. And I finally see George that we have been signed up for Paramount Plus and Discovery Plus for 10 months. Like wow. no clue. You've Never opened the app. For 10 months straight. For 10 months straight. Ouch. That is so embarrassing. What does right? that add up? Like, Did you what? figure out what that number is? Like, it's like well over $100. It's $10 for one charge and $5 for the other. Ouch. Right? So I call Amazon and I'm like... <gasps> I did something stupid. <laughs> I'm surprised they even picked up. A real person picked up. Oh, it took a while. I had to like go, go through, through some form. Tree. And then like they had the automated system. I just kept being like real person, real person, customer service, real person. And finally someone picked up and they were like, yeah, we can give you a refund. We'll, we'll do one month. And I was like, one month? I was like, can I at least have a few months? So they refunded three months and I had seven months still of stupid tax. Wow. I know, y'all. I spent nearly $100. That's got to hurt. In stupid tax. Never opened the app. And I think, I guess the only thing I can imagine is that our kids like grab the remote at some point Did and you try to watch like the first episode of yellowstone or something <laughs> no not that i Wait, know of. was it the new iCarly reboot oh george you caught on me. paramount plus you caught me <laughs> it's the only reason i can imagine signing up for this thing wow I mean, yeah so Those subscriptions I'm like, will get you y'all i promise i'm good with money but that's real stupid mm. <laughs> i'm like there you go so that's my stupid tax story but thank god for no spend month because i'm like I'd have woke up three years from now and been like, wait, what? What have we been paying for? What have we been paying for? So this is the strategy of these companies. Right? It's just like you forget about it and it's a small enough that you don't really fight it. At least you tried to fight back and I you tried. got three months back. I tried, but I mean, I also kind of deserved it. Like that's just a good reminder to me to like pay attention to the details. Don't just get lazy and be like, oh, well, it's just one transaction that I didn't realize what it was. There you go. Like I should have been paying better attention. Like that is on me. And also these companies can be kind of sneaky. Like there's also like, 
like, you know, if you've got your smart TV or whatever, and they have like a show up there and it looks like it's part of your queue. But sometimes ah. when you click on it, it's like the seven day free trial. Yep. And in actuality, you're signing up for an account with that service provider. So I'm like, man, or it was just my kids. I, I don't did know, that but... last week. I signed up. It was like a Showtime. There's a movie that's only on Showtime. So I was like, great, I'll sign up for the free trial. I immediately went into my phone and canceled it. And it says, cool, you have 29 mm-hmm. days left of your trial. Enjoy. And it was done. So I think a good life hack is to immediately cancel it. And they'll usually still give you the remainder of your trial. That's good. If you know what happens, so there's your life hack. Oh, and yeah, do a little budget audit. Go yes. back into all of your bank statements and go, do we actually know what that was for? Is that legit? Do we still need that? And you will give yourself a raise just in doing that. Yeah, and that's one of the benefits of doing a no spend month because it's like you clear out everything. And so what's left, you really have to evaluate. That was one of our goals this month is, you know, since we're not spending anything and even with groceries, we're just paying cash for groceries. So it's like anything in our account that's not supposed to be there is going to show up. So we've been evaluating every subscription, everything that comes through our account, even things that are like somewhat needed. We're like, is there a better way to get that cheaper? Is there a way that we can cut down? Because the goal is not just to not spend for a month, we're trying to, you know, buckle down on our budget as much as possible. Cut down all the expenses long term. I yeah. love it. Well, thank you for sharing and being so vulnerable. You're so brave, Christina. Oh, man. I'm so embarrassed brave. by that one. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, George. Well, let's get to the phones. Angela is in Akron, Ohio. Angela, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How's it going? Good. How are you? We are doing great. How can we help today? Okay, I have a question. I have $18,000 on a HELOC loan at currently it's like 9.2%. Okay, so when I was reviewing some other financial things and looking and thinking of ideas of how to, uh, you know, reduce this, I looked into my 401k. Now, my current rate of return is only 47 so I can borrow 14000 of that um, from my 401k. Is that smart for me to do? No. That would be okay. equivalent to you having uh, an arm injury and going, you know what, I'm going to break my leg to move the pain there to make <laughs> the arm better. And so we're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. And even worse, you're robbing Angela's future with interest. What well, kind of friend would Angela when be? You put back your in- when I was told when you pay back your interest, you're you're paying your interest to yourself. So that's like, not a li- that makes no continue. sense. Then why wouldn't we uh, all be borrowing from our four hundred one k's because it's a money making scheme? I, I just found the gold mine. No, it it's got it's going to the company. You're not giving yourself interest. You're paying the payment back into the account, but the interest you're not gaining. That goes to the company. So the lady on the phone that said, well, the interest goes back to your account, she's meaning like to their account. Yes. There's no way that is factual. So I would not do this 401k loan for a thousand reasons. I would go ahead and attack this HELOC with a vengeance. What did you use the HELOC for? Uh, I had to, it was a divorce situation. I had to get out of my primary mortgage, which I was only at like 3%. So then I uh, I got the HELOC, and at the time I thought that I thought that I had signed on at five percent fixed, you know, because it was a special. It was supposed to be a special thing of the HELOC. Well, it turns out, needless to say, it didn't work out that way. So now I'm just at the variable rate. So my total amount, and it's on my mortgage. My actual total amount is like thirty three thousand. So what I was going to do is take 15000 of that, and I have an offer for 0% interest for no. like 15 months, and then get the Angela, other you keep getting bitten by snakes, there. and you keep going back into a den of snakes. You don't think that that's the, a none smart of, move? The only solution is to pay off the debt. There's no amount of borrowing we can do and moving things around from the 0% over here. You're just going to keep falling into these traps. Well, and Angela, I appreciate your vulnerability because you said like, <laughs> like, I'm frustrated for you. Right. And you thought you hit a gold mine and you were not the only I person. Did. Like, that is why these companies have skyscrapers. That's why there's people that fall into these traps because it seems so good on the front end. 
Yeah, we need to get on a budget, sell everything you can, make as much money as you can, and attack your debts from smallest to largest using the debt snowball method. Hang on the line. I'm going to send you Financial Peace University. It'll walk you step by step through this. I'm also going to gift you Every Dollar Premium, our budgeting tool. And these things paired hand in hand will get you out of this mess without having to borrow any more money. Run away from all of these offers. They're not offering you anything but lifelong payments. Thanks for the call, Angela. This is The Ramsey Show. Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. I'm George Campbell, joined by Christina Ellis this hour. The number to call is 888-825-5225. All right, Christina, so we just took a question from Angela, and she was asking if she should borrow from her 401k to pay off the HELOC. Oof. And we, of course, told her this is a, a bad idea. Do not borrow from your 401k for a whole bunch of reasons. But it also brought me to the idea of the HELOC, because I just saw this article yesterday from lifehacker.com, and here's the headline, Why Every Homeowner Should Have a HELOC Ready to Go. And so the author goes on to explain that a hurricane had swept through and his first floor turned into an aquarium, and so they didn't have the money for the repairs, but then he remembered they took out a HELOC, which is a line of credit against your home, and it saved their butts. And uh, it goes on to explain how HELOCs are the greatest emergency fund and it just reminded me that, uh, you know, it's a better emergency fund, an emergency fund. Right. With money in the bank instead of putting your house at risk. Oh. And so that's exactly what a HELOC is, is it's a home equity line of credit. It's what it stands for. And along with uh, your HELOC that you get approved for, there's transaction fees, minimum withdrawal fees, inactivity fees, early termination fees, required balances. And of course, there's a variable interest rate, Christina. Oh, George, that's painful. And they say it's based on the market, but really it's just however they want to screw you that month is how that works. And here's what the scary part is. When you take out a HELOC, your home is at risk because if you default, you misstep on those payments, the bank can take your home. And an emergency fund is supposed to protect you, not put you at more risk, right? Like this is not a safe way to go about things. This, they are not your friends. They are not there to protect well, people you. People see it like, well, it's just attached to my home. So it's better than going and taking on new debt. Oh, yikes. And but it's they, also attached to your home, your primary residence. Yes. Super scary. It does not create cash flow. It's just a giant credit card attached to your house that can also make your house go away because the bank can take it. So instead of the HELOC, here's a better solution. Have an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses and have good homeowner's insurance in place and check on that homeowner's insurance every year because as the value of your home goes up, you need to make sure the replacement cost is also going up inside of that homeowner's insurance. That's such a good call out. And it's just a good reminder, you know, to let today be the day where you check your subscriptions, you check your insurance, make sure you're up to date on everything and have everything you need. Because it's, you know, you don't want to look back after something like a hurricane or some sort of natural disaster and think, if I had just made a phone call and adjusted things a little bit, things could be totally different. Like, let this be your wake up call to check your insurance and make sure everything is set. Yeah, we are seeing a rise in people taking out these HELOCs and 401k loans because they're going, well, it's better than a credit card oh. and I can't have the credit limit that I can with my HELOC. And it's just a different way, a different trap, different flavor of the day that's holding Americans back from building wealth. Well, and it's also kind of just a different mindset. Like when Angela was talking, she was like, I thought this was the golden thing, but then I got this 0% financing offer. And what if I put it over here? And it's like, or 
What if we just got aggressive and paid it off and had an emergency fund? Like you got to shift your mindset to, you know, not just look at these like quick fixes and these things that involve debt, like try to actually solve the root cause, like the root issue, which is getting rid of the debt and then having an emergency fund so that you don't go back in debt. Yeah. Don't fall for these marketing shortcuts. These companies are offering you with 0% introductory offers. Mm. There's no free money out there. The only way to do this is to pay it off. And we recommend the debt snowball method. List out your balances from smallest to largest. Take on the side job. Do the overtime. Cut the expenses down to nothing. It's the only way to get this debt out of your life once and for all. And it's worth the effort. It is worth the effort for that peace of mind, like to not have to live in this anxiety-filled game of trying to figure out how to beg, borrow, and steal to keep things moving around. Like you can solve this for good. Amen. All right, let's get to the phones. Ashlyn awaits in Fairbanks, Alaska. Ashlyn, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. We are glad to have you on the line. How can we help? So I'm getting married in 17 days. Woo, congrats. Exciting. (laughs) Thank you. Um, So my fiance and I are kind of in a big life transition point. We're both going to graduate this spring. And he's about to go off to PhD school. Um, he's going to go for his bachelor or his, uh, his PhD in chemistry. Um, and so we're looking at a bit of a move. And um, he's definitely like for his PhD school, they're going to cover at least the first few years. But it's possible that they won't that he won't have funding for an additional couple years if he has to go on like a five or a six year plan. Um, so my question really is. I'm looking at saving up money to cover those last couple years of his tuition if we have to, but I'm not sure what the best way to save that money is. Um, He kind of wants to put it in some kind of like real estate. um, But since we're moving and all of that, I don't want to try to invest in real estate. I'm looking at like um, just high yield savings accounts or bonds or something like that, but I don't know what the best way to save that money is. So what's the timeline for this? Are we talking two years from now? You might need to have this cash liquid we're talking like four to five years okay and how much are you thinking like if if you have to pay for that last few years what's the total cost um that depends a lot on where we go he's got like three very different top schools right now um one of them is dartmouth one is uc davis and one is um university of colorado boulder so it would vary a lot um but definitely i'm thinking in the 40 to sixty thousand range so are any of these schools offering like a full ride completely paid all the way through? Um, we're not entirely sure yet. That's kind of we're in the stage still of figuring that out. Um, and that'll depend a little bit. They'll kind of dictate where we go. But I'm thinking that they'll offer usually, usually they offer at least four years. But if you take an additional couple of years, um, they often don't cover that. And and. Walk us through, okay, what would take a couple more years? Like they've got the four years of funding and what's kind of the variables that would determine Mm -hmm. if it takes longer? So the variables really are just like how fast he wants to get through it, um, how much he wants to put into it. I mean, Would he be working during this time? He would be. So a lot of the PhD school is research-based. So he'd get paid a little bit for the research or if he took on a TA position, um, he would get paid for that a little bit. but are there employers that would fund family. this if he just went into the workforce full time? Are there employers that would go, hey, we'll fund your PhD? I don't, I don't know, honestly. Um, I don't know what that would what, look like. What was his purpose in getting the PhD to. now versus waiting and working a little bit? Um, just to continue his studies, I guess. He really wants to become a professor. Okay. So if I'm in your shoes, like I'm doing a lot of this research on the front end. I love that right now you're diving into savings and we'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, one of the biggest things is like diving into these details and this ROI analysis, making sure it's going to pay off. And even with the different years, like getting super motivated on the front end to say, you know, I don't want to take six years. If I got four years paid for and I'm not working outside of this, like I'm going to make sure I finish in four years because that's a huge problem with undergrad right now. I think the stat is like only 40 percent of people graduate in four years. And it's like each of those 
those years costs a ton of money. So I would be really thinking wisely and even just like get out a spreadsheet and start doing the numbers with each school. Like ask those details, talk to the scholarship department, the financial aid department, ask them, you know, I want to know and map out exactly how much this is going to cost me, what years are paid for. And, you know, compare that before you decide on this huge move, which is so exciting, getting married in 17 days, all these cool transitions. Like I want to know the numbers because in if I'm in your shoes, like that's going to make a huge, that's going to be a huge factor in deciding where we go, where we start our lives. Um, and then just also, like George said, evaluating the ROI of actually getting the degree, you know, is right now the best time to do it? Is there an employer that would possibly pay for it? Is there a school that you can go to completely free? Because there are PhD programs that are free all the way through. So do you guys have any debt right now? We do not. Okay. Well, if I'm looking at it on paper, it looks like you have to save 10 grand a year for the next four years, just in case, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know that yeah. that's worth investing. You could put it in index funds if you wanted to, but you're probably just better off putting that in a high yield savings account. You can get three or 4% right now. Or a 529. Or a 529 is another great option um, to, ha to have some tax benefits as well. So good okay. luck on the journey. It sounds like there's a lot of variables. Just get through the wedding right now. We can make the other decisions later. Congratulations. I'm going to send you guys Financial Peace University as a wedding gift on us as well. So hang on the line. Austin will get that over to you. That puts this hour of The Ramsey Show in the books. My thanks to Christina Ellis and all the folks in the booth and you, America. Appreciate you listening. We'll be back real soon. Hey, George Camel here. If you love the show and you want a deeper dive on your money journey, we've got a weekly newsletter that gives you helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for the newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. From the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods moving and storage studio, it's The Ramsey Show, where America hangs out to have a conversation about your life and your money. I'm your host, George Camel, joined this hour by Christina Ellis, and the number to call is 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. Well, Christine, I want to kick off this hour talking about something that so many people are struggling with in today's America, and that is rent prices. Here's an article from Axios.com. I'm going to read the headline in my own way because this is a family-friendly show. <laughs> Data shows the rent is still too dang high. Oh. Yeah, it says the average American household is now considered rent burden with a record share of renters spending more than 30 percent of income on rent each month. Mm. This is a painful surge for many coming to, coming at a time when inflation has driven up the cost of food and energy costs. Credit card debt is rising. Spending is falling. And there's a shift in spending to more necessi necessary items rather than luxury type purchases. Well, that's that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> but rents are sticky. They are likely to climb much further. They're not, they aren't likely to climb. They aren't likely yeah. to. Oh, gosh. Thank God. That's good. I got spooked. <laughs> but don't expect them to fall much from where they are now. Mm. And, of course, the Ugh. surge in home prices in the housing market has pushed this number up. And, you know, inflation, supply and demand, a lot of factors here. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just a lot of frustrated everyday people going like, this is insane. My rent went up, you know, another 600 bucks. And I can't do anything about it. And so we wanted to give you guys some practical things you can do. There's no magic trick here. There's no silver bullet. I'm not going to give you some life hack. These are all things that take compromise, sacrifice. They're not fun, but it will put you in a better financial situation. Yeah. And, and and we just empathize because we got team members here who've had to move because it's like all of a sudden their landlord raised their rent or their apartment complex raised their rent $400, $600, which that's a lot. Even for somebody who's budgeting, who's living on a budget and being disciplined with their money, it's, it's pretty painful to see those numbers. But we do want to give you hope because there are strategies around that. Yeah. I mean, right here where our headquarters is, Franklin, Tennessee, Ooh. Williamson County, I think it's the 10th or 11th wealthiest county in the nation. 
And so if you work in this area, it's hard to live in this area. And Dave always jokes about when he was a kid, you know, he lived on the other side of the tracks <laughs> miles away going like, oh, well, that's where the rich people live. And, you know, cost of living is a real issue. And a lot of people who live on the coasts, if you live in the Bay Area or you live in New York or Boston or New Jersey, you feel this pain when you're not making $300,000 as someone who works at Google or someone who just got laid off from Google, more likely. And you're going, what do I do when I make thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars and I still have this crazy high rent? Well, and some people kind of just close their eyes and they kind of make the the excuse that like there's no other option or the I mean, it's, I, I hesitate to say excuse because it's like I feel for y'all and I feel for people in this situation. But the option is not to stick your head in the sand and go, well, I got to spend 50 percent of my income on rent because it's like that has very long term consequences. So we want you to be super strategic and really think through, you know, even though this is crazy and the market is crazy and it's unfortunate, like what can we do? So for starters, if you are single, this is especially hard for you because you don't have, you know, the possibility of dual income where you have both spouses working, which really helps cover that rent number. And so you might need to go get a roommate and do that in a safe way, of course, vet people through Facebook communities, mutual friends, and see if you can cut all of your expenses in half by doing that. I know it's not fun. If you're a grown adult, to try to get a roommate in your late 20s, 30s, even 40s is hard. And it feels awkward, but if it cuts your expenses in half and allows you to pay off debt and build wealth, then it's worth it for a season. Yeah. And another thing is to shop around. So one, if you cannot be in a hurry when you need to move, that's great. If you can give yourself a little bit of runway, if you know that your lease is going to be up in four months or even in two months and that your landlord may raise your rent, start thinking about that right, right now and start thinking about, you know, are there other places in the area and do your research. So we actually sold our house last year and we decided we wanted to rent for, you know, a bit while we moved down here and kind of figured out where we wanted to live. And I shopped around like crazy. And I'm going to be real honest, y'all. The rent deal we found was bonkers. But I, I largely think it was because I kind of got pretty obsessed with the like research process. And now I look at the cost and I'm like, that is actually crazy. So, you know, look for those diamonds in the rough. Don't just go, you know, I like this glamorous complex that has this really cool pool. The granite and countertops, the hardwood floors, it's been renovated. That may be out of the budget right now. Right. And you may get a way better deal down the street for somewhere that's still really great, but just way more in your budget. And the other thing is go further down the street, literally further out of the expensive areas. And yes, there may be somewhat of a commute instead of a 15 minute, it may be 30 minutes, but that's worth it if you can save 400 bucks a month. And the other piece of this is a lot of people are now working remotely. So if you're one of those people, you have the opportunity to live anywhere. Let me remind you. And while it's ideal to live in downtown Manhattan, it may be more ideal financially to be further out in Astoria. George, I'm hesitant for you to say that because I'm like, that means more people are going to come to Tennessee. <laughs> come on down. Hey, they're going to be here anyways. Not because I told oh, them to. Oh, man, our costs And now it's too so expensive much. to live here. So they're like, oh, I'm going further out. But there are things you can do. And again, none of these are like ideal silver bullets. And hopefully the market comes back down and cools off a little bit and we'll slowly see those rent prices come down. But for now, we also can go make more income. And so if you are making 30 and you feel like you've been in this thing too long, you should be making more. Go apply for those new jobs. Sharpen up the resume. Our friend Ken Coleman has some great resources at his website, kencoleman.com, to help you with that. But if you can make 50 instead of 30, well, that changes the numbers now and we can breathe. And lastly, getting out of debt will help you breathe when it comes to affording your rent. One of the reasons rent feels so crazily high is because you also have $700, $800 in payments on this side because of your student loans, your car payments, the credit card payments, the personal loans, it all adds up. Well, and just really making sure that you're buckling down on your budget. Like, I've, we're pretty intense with our budget, but we've been doing this no spend month. And it's been crazy looking at the numbers of how much we saved. Like, we thought we were pretty tight on our budget. And at the end of the month, we are saving so much money. Like, we thought we couldn't eat on $100 a week. And we did it. And we found all these other ways to save. So it's like, even if you are on a budget, like, really evaluate it deeply and see if there's anywhere else you can cut so that you have a little bit of breathing room. And that's a great reminder, Christina. Our parameters as far as rent or mortgage goes is no more than 25% of your after-tax income. And so that, if that's you and you're doing the numbers, you're going, my rent is 1500 bucks and I take home three grand. 
well, that's 50% of your income being eaten up. It's going to be hard to live and to build wealth and to save and to pay off that debt and to put food on the table, to put eggs on the table Ugh. when that much of your life is being eaten up by the rent. And so it, you've, we've got to find a solution and go, all right, we need a roommate. We need to move further out and we need to get on a budget. And so you can jump on to every dollar. That's our budgeting tool. You can use it for free and start to crunch these numbers and figure out where we can shave some expenses. How can we figure out how to afford the expenses we really need? and figure out what the needs are versus the wants. And we want the nice apartment, but that might be down the line. Once we're out of debt and we increase our income, and maybe one day we won't have that pesky roommate leaving the dishes in the sink. That's a tough one for me, Christina. Yeah, that is tough. I'm glad I have a roommate now and it's my wife. Best roommate I've ever had. Gosh, no more dudes. Just the (laughs) dudes. Get it together, guys. Oh, my gosh. All right. More of your calls coming up. 888-825-5225. This is The Ramsey Show. We've been doing business at Ramsey for more than 30 years. By now, we're a well-oiled machine, but it wasn't always that way. Yes, we've always had a vision, always had determination, and a drive to help people, but what we didn't have was one central place to access all our numbers so that we could get further ahead or quickly see when we needed to pivot. We were always jumping back and forth between different systems and spreadsheets. So when NetSuite by Oracle helped us wrangle our revenue, inventory, expenses, and more into one place, it was a game changer. And NetSuite's number one cloud financial system can help your business gain the same visibility because businesses thrive on timely data. And NetSuite's real-time analytics can help your business have immediate access to your numbers daily so you always know where you stand and you can move quickly. So go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey today and set up a free product tour. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. This is The Ramsey Show. You know, paying off debt is smart. Saving and investing is smart. But there's one key to winning with money that people overlook all the time. And that is protecting your finances from emergencies. And that is where insurance comes into play. Now, there are 10 types of insurance that you might need based on what your life looks like today. And lucky for you, we've built a tool called the Coverage Checkup to show you exactly which types you need to add, to drop, and to adjust. We'll even rank your coverage list by importance, email it to you, and connect you with the Ramsey Trusted Insurance Providers so you can get your plan in place fast. Seriously, this could be the most important five minutes you spend today. Uh, A friend of ours, Donald H., wrote in, and I like how he puts it, for anyone who has not completed this checkup, do it now. You never know when something will happen, and you never want to leave your family in a bad situation. So this is totally free. Just go to RamseySolutions.com slash checkup. That's RamseySolutions.com slash checkup. Do not let an emergency sneak up on you. Protect your family now. All right. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Debbie joins us up next in Anchorage, Alaska. Debbie, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Absolutely. What's going on? Um, I recently received a $200,000 settlement check, and we are trying to decide what is the best use of the fund. If it would be better to pay um, one of our loans off on our vacation rental home, or if it's better to invest it or what you would recommend. All right. What was the settlement from? Um, I was a CFO of an organization, and I discovered a lot of fraud and embezzlement, and through the process, um, I received the check. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm usually it's you were in a terrible accident. So as far as how settlements go, you got you know, that, that's one of the better ones I've heard. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. It worked it, it out okay. <laughs> but it sounds yeah. like it was a nasty situation. So, it was a tough few years. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're past it. And is that money already in the bank? Yes, it is. Ah, oh, I bet you're breathing a lot easier Ooh. now. So yes. where where are you guys at financially? Do you, how much money did you already have in the bank? Um, we have a comfortable amount of savings in our bank account, and we have no debt except for our um, second home, which we use um, for a vacation home or a rental home when we're not there. Awesome. So we have no Your primary residence is paid for? Oh, yeah. What's mm-hmm. left on this uh, vacation property on the mortgage? Um, 500000 um, 150000 which I'm considering paying off, is um, a home equity line of credit um, to the other part of the mortgage. So total owed outstanding is 550000 Okay. Yeah, I would. that would be the next step is to pay that down. So unless there's other things you had planned expenses for, like maintenance, repairs, a roof, the HVAC, upgrading a car, I would throw this at that. I would not invest the money. And y'all have a fully funded emergency fund, correct? Yeah. And you're investing do. toward retirement? Yes, I do have an invest on retirement accounts through employers, yes. Are you guys doing 15% into those accounts? No. What's the amount currently? Um, whatever is equally matched, roughly about 3%. Are you doing any investing beyond that? No, I think that's where we need some help. Ah. So I don't better to use the 200,000 for investment or maybe another rental property, um, you know, more, um, land. Or What's your what, household income? Um, roughly a hundred thousand. Okay. And how old are y'all? Um, I'm almost, um, in mid fifties, my husband's retired. Okay. So he's not working. Does he have any source of income? Um, minimal. Okay. Um, no, yeah. So it's no, basically no. all on you and you're making a hundred K and we want to retire with dignity someday. Yes. But then in addition, we have the rental income, but you know, that's nothing we can guarantee, you know? I just want to say I'm glad I'm not the only one that takes a few seconds to think about how old she is. <laughs> mm, what do I want to say here? <laughs> Carry the three. That's yeah. me now. <laughs> so, Debbie, here's what I would do if I'm in your shoes. I'm going to increase my investing to 15% in my – you said it's a 401k? Yeah. Okay. Is there I – would, I would put 15% in that 401k. Do you, ha, you can also use a Roth IRA. And so here's the order you would do this in. Take the match, which you're already doing. Beyond that, we can max out a Roth IRA for the year, which uh, for you in your 50s, I believe there's a $1,000 catch-up contribution, so you might be able to put a Think 7500 in there for the year. So you could max that out and then go back to the 401k and finish out the 15%, which for you would be $15,000 total from your income. Okay. And then any money beyond that, let's start attacking this vacation property and get this thing paid for. How does that feel? Do you feel like you have margin in your budget to start increasing your investments? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. How often are you guys at the vacation property? Um, We try to do um, like three, four months a year, the rest of the um, year rented out. Okay. And is that ROIing well? Is it paying yeah, What's off? the net profit per year on that? After all expenses, um, yeah. maintenance, mortgage, all that. Roughly 75000 Okay. Well, I would use all the profit and try to get this thing paid off before you guys retire. And once you have this thing paid off, let's max out all the retirement we can so that you don't have to work for another 15, 20 years. Okay. That would be the goal. So I'm using most of this settlement to pay down the mortgage outside of maxing out the Roth IRA for the year. And let's bump up your investment contributions to 15% so that we can ratchet up that compound interest growth over the next decade. And I would encourage you to go to RamseySolutions.com and look for our retirement savings calculator. It's really fun to play with those calculators. I think a lot of people think like, I'm in my 50s, it's not worth trying to save for retirement, and they feel scared that they can't get there. But when you get in those calculators and you see how much 
how much you can save in 20 years, how powerful compound interest is, and that you really can hit an amazing spot within 20 years. It's exciting. So I want you to you know, do that so you can get excited around this. And this is something where you're like, okay, we're going to tag this because in 20 years, we want to be baby step millionaires with paid off houses and you know, your primary residence and the second one. I think you can get really excited around it. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, I'm inspired. I just met a, a nice gentleman out there in the lobby. We go out during the breaks and he let us know casually he's a baby steps millionaire with two paid off properties his primary residence and now a vacation home in florida and he's riding sky high no yep. payments in the world and he's been doing this plan he told us for 15 years really focused on it i'm sure he still had a good head on his shoulders before that uh to get to that point and set him up for success but you can do this and a lot of people christina they go like well it's too late for me i didn't know this stuff when i was mm. 20 and so i'm now in my 50s and what's the point i'm not going to make that much progress you would be shocked at how much progress you can make in five to 10 years. And a lot of people in their 50s, they're making the most money they've made in their careers. Right. So it's a great time to finally get rid of that debt have that emergency fund in place and begin maxing out their retirement contributions. Absolutely. It's a great time. And that's why it's just so exciting to see the numbers because, yeah, I think a lot of people just write themselves off. They feel hopeless. They're like, it's too late. But it's like when you see the numbers and you see how it works, it feels like magic. You're like, wait, really? Like if I only save this much money, I can be here in 20 years? Wow, let's go. When baby step millionaire, that term feels like, well, that's not, I'll never be that. But when you think about what a millionaire is, it's just having a net worth of a million dollars. So what you own minus what you owe, your assets minus liabilities. So if you have a paid for home that's worth $500,000 and you have $500,000 sitting in 401ks and IRAs, you by definition are a millionaire. You don't need to make a million dollars a year. In fact, the top three careers that we found in our millionaire study were engineer, accountants, and teachers. People who for sure don't make a million dollars a year. And the reason is they're process-driven people. Yep. They've got a good head on their shoulders. They're not trying to impress people with luxury cars and mansions. They're just going to work every day and putting money away into those retirement accounts. And over a long period of time, that money grows thanks to compound interest. And all of a sudden you wake up one day and you go, oh my gosh, we can do what we want. Yes. We can work because we want to, not because we have to. That's the kind of decisions I want to be able to make as I get older. And that's what you can do when you follow this Ramsey plan. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Visit Blinds.com to save up to 40% off everything site-wide. Go to Blinds.com for more information. This is The Ramsey Show. I'm George Campbell, joined by Christina Ellis this hour. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Our question of the day comes from Rebecca in Oklahoma. She writes in, and here's her question. My boyfriend and I plan to get married after graduating in May with our degrees in physical therapy. We anticipate starting salaries of sixty to 70000 Our only debts will be our student loans, 115000 for him, 137000 for me. 
We've started discussing money, particularly paying off student loans, and want to get started on the right foot. We already have our emergency fund saved, so we'll be starting on step two when we graduate. We know you guys recommend staying away from income-driven repayment plans and to use the debt snowball method instead. If we're using that snowball, we should be paying off his first. Should we work at paying mine off at the same time, or is there a better way to knock out this debt? Whew. So the first thing that stands out to me is how she says our only debts are around 250000 That's a lot of loans. Whoa. Like the word Just casually. only. Ha! Huh, like makes me sick to my stomach for them. That is, that's oh. a lot. And I mean, she's got an emergency fund saved. So, I mean, that's... Which we don't know if that's the starter of a thousand or if they went then skip to step three and have a fully funded emergency fund. I'm going to assume it's the $1,000 starter. Well, and the first thing I'm going to say is like, let's level set. This is not only, air quotes, $250,000 in debt. This is this a quarter is, of a million dollars. Right. This is a big when deal. When you make 60. Yeah, you're starting off your married life with $250,000 in student loans. This is a big deal. Like, we need to attack it like it's a big deal. So here's what I'm seeing if the numbers are adding up. They should be making... Combined, a household income of one hundred twenty to one hundred forty thousand, and they have total student loan debt of two hundred and fifty-two thousand. Mm. So, if you're using the debt snowball method, most student loan balances they're of that size and magnitude are probably broken out into smaller loans. So, I wouldn't see it as we're going to pay off his first, then mine. I would just break it out by each individual student loan and each individual balance, line those up from smallest to largest, regardless of what the interest rates are and attack the little one first, make minimum payments on the rest. And as you do that, you'll knock them out faster, you're gonna free up the payments, you're gonna feel the progress, you're gonna stay motivated along the way, you can use visual trackers to you know, stay excited about this, celebrate every little milestone, and it's gonna take a while. Hopefully your incomes continue to go up. Physical therapists can make great money, so my hope is that they can each make six figures and they knock this debt out. Within the next, I'm gonna give them a timeline of four years. I think they could do this. Well, and I think if you have that mindset shift where you start going, this is a lot of money and this makes me uncomfortable and I want to get rid of it. Like you can pick up extra jobs. You know, you can see if you can take every overtime shift possible for your physical therapy job, like do anything you can to get this paid off quickly. But first you got to realize this is a problem. Like don't say it's only $250,000. This is not, we'll get to it when we get to it. Right. This is our full-time job is getting rid of this debt. And the good news is that you're you're young. You're getting married after graduation. This is the time in life where you have time to work those extra jobs. You don't have kids yet. Like, get this out of the way so that you're free moving forward. Attack it, scorched earth, with aggression so that it's gone. And then you have the rest of your married life ahead free from all of this. Mm. And if you want to get aggressive at this and you can get that income up, you know, you could do this in three years. Think about it this way. If you could throw $84,000 at these student loans every year, which if you're making 140 is possible. If you're making 150 160 170 it's even more possible. Then we can knock this out in three years. That's exciting. 36 months. This can be out of your life. And so don't wait on forgiveness. Don't wait on the White House. Let's get about the business of getting rid of Sally Mae's prison that she's put us in. Well, George, this just gets me so fired up. Like this topic in general, the fact that there are students graduating from college saying that they only have $250,000 in student loan debt. That is a toxic system that mm -hmm. has taught kids that $250,000 in student loans, no big deal, that everybody takes them out, that they're necessary. It's a rite of passage. We all just take out debt to get these degrees. We're not even sure what we're going to do with the degrees, but let's take out the loans to get them. It's so frustrating, mm. which is why we've got our documentary, Borrowed Future, which is exposing that toxic system. This massive student loan crisis. 45 million Americans are in debt because of their education. And how did we get here? Well, we do the full expose in our award-winning documentary, Borrowed Future, uncovering this dark side of the student loan industry. And what's cool, Christina, is it's always been available you know, on Amazon, Amazon Prime Video. We put it on YouTube earlier this year, which is exciting. But now, for the first time ever, it's available on Fox Nation. So, uh, you know, you can find shows, documentaries, and movies there that celebrate America. And this is a different kind of celebration of America. This is celebrating what we could be if we got out of this toxic student loan crisis that we're in. And here's what's crazy. The average is now $38,792 for graduates. 
in student loan debt. And Christina Ellis is featured in that documentary, as well as Dave Ramsey, Dr. John Deloney, a bunch of industry insiders, uh, Mike Rowe, Mark Cuban, lots of thought leaders weigh in on this epic failure of the student loan program and expose how the system is built to work against you. And it's like, parents, if you're hearing this right now, sit down with your students tonight, this weekend, and watch this documentary, especially if they're in high school, if they're about to walk towards this cliff, sit down with them, have this conversation, talk about money, even if it's weird, even if it's uncomfortable, even if they don't really want to hear it, have the conversation. Mm. And the great thing about a documentary is it's not like we're going to sit down and have this boring conversation about money. You can say, hey, can we watch a movie together this weekend? Yes. It feels more like a movie. It's very exciting. Yeah. Thrilling. Twists and turns. You but it can it. save them from so much in the long run. It can really shift their mindset and help them go to school debt free. Absolutely. So tune into Borrowed Future on Amazon Prime Video YouTube and now Fox Nation. Love it. Let's get to the phones. Jasmine awaits in Long Island. Jasmine, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you guys for having me. Sure. What's your question? Um, I, had a, I had a question. Um, my boyfriend and I are about to turn four years and and we have been talking about marriage for a little bit. I graduate next year. He's currently not in school. And we're we're both tackling individually our own debt. I should be done in the next six months. He should be done paying off his car, which is the only thing that he has, um, by the end of the year. But um, we, I just don't really know kind of where we should be at financially, individually, or even together Um um, before we actually get married, because I know that there's a lot of a lot of things to save up for, you know, like the wedding or the apartment, or if he wants a house, like so he does say that he wants a house, but it doesn't have to be a very expensive or a big house, but he does want to live in a home. Um, I, I we discussed that. I told him we'd discuss that later on, but I just don't know where we should really be at financially because I want our marriage to start successful. Love it. When you all talk about money, how do those conversations go? Do you feel like you're pretty much on the same page or what do they look like? Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, it was a very long, like it was a while. For me, I was always a spender. I did not listen to the Rainbow Show. I was very much always, I had the most debt and I worked to pay that off. And he's helped me kind of motivate me to get me there. And now we're finally both on the same page. So I started financial education university. He has not. Whoa. He's still kind of like, oh. What's he doing? Yeah, does he, he not is, want to marry Jasmine? He does. It's just, if he knows like this he, is important to you, he should be doing it. Yeah, I've been I've been telling him. So hopefully, I, he's very close to actually doing it. But we've both come a long way in terms of how, how we're on the same page about finances. Okay. Well, there's no particular way that you have to be this way before you're married. The best thing you can do is to be completely debt-free with a fully funded emergency fund and pay cash for the wedding. Do not go into debt for the wedding. Do it on a strict budget. Weddings can get out of control. Of course, he's going to have to save up and get that engagement ring. And I would not be jumping into home ownership anytime soon. You guys need to rent for a year somewhere, start saving up that down payment. If you're going to stay in Long Island, it's freaking expensive, isn't it? Yes, it is. And That's so my worry. It might be a, f- a longer journey, or we decide we're going to move further away. And uh, either way, it's going to take a little while to save that down payment. Don't let him rush into this because he thinks he's a fancy man now because he's a married man and you got to have a home. That's a bunch of bull crap. So go slow. Both of you becoming debt-free with a fully funded emergency fund, cash flowing the wedding, that is the best thing you can do. And I hope he goes to Financial Peace University with you. Otherwise, we're going to have some hard conversations with this guy. Thanks for the call. Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. I'm George Campbell, joined by Christina Ellis this hour. The number to call is 888-825-5225. I know lots of you out there 
You've got some goals to improve your money, improve your career, improve your relationships this year. And if you want a proven plan to crush the debt and build wealth, you can do that with Dave's best-selling book, The Total Money Makeover, and learn the seven baby steps to guide you along your money journey. And if every day feels like a Monday for you and you're not happy with where you're at in your career, it's time to change that. And you can do that with Ken Coleman's Get Clear Career Assessment and learn exactly what you were created to do and what careers fit you best. And of course, if you want to deepen your relationship with your spouse, your kids, your friends, your family, you can pick up John Deloney's Questions for Humans decks, which are super fun and a great way to build those connections, build those relationships. Get all of those books and tools that will take your goals to the next level. Order them today at RamseySolutions.com slash store. All right, Karen joins us up next in Salt Lake City. Karen, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Sure. Um, My husband and I are working on the plan, and um, so we plan to have all of our debt paid off by the end of the year. Awesome. Uh, We have a a very clear plan of how much we want to save in the next five years, and that in the next, or in about five years, we would like to move and to buy a home. And that's where it kind of gets tricky for us. Um, We hear a lot of examples on the show of people paying off their homes that cost, you know, $100,000 to $400,000. And for us, that's kind of like laughable because we don't live in those kind of states. Um, Over where we live or where we would love to live, which is Colorado, to get a decent quality home with maybe four bedrooms for a family of five, we would need at least about $500,000. Um, and okay. to be able to do that on, on Ramsey's plan, um, what we've kind of tried to calculate is to have the 15 year mortgage, 25% of our income, um, we would really need to be making at least 200,000 a year, um, which is, you know, I mean, double what we make now. So you guys um, make a hundred. Uh, so my husband makes about 80 and then next month I'll be opening a daycare at, at our home here and I'll be making about 50. Okay. So, so that would put you about 130. There. And yeah. are you, are y'all um, homeowners right now? We do. We own a condo in Utah. And how much do you have left on that? So we just moved in here. Um, so we still have 360. That is. Um, it sounds like a ton. So it's brand new. We just moved in like six months ago. Um, here in Utah, like the cheapest thing you could get with three bedrooms and two baths is, is like three hundred to four hundred thousand. So that's kind of why we what's the house we worth? struggle with what's the, the mortgage condo worth? section. That's what it's worth because we just got it. So well I guess it's more worth like three eighty, maybe See, how much did you put down? Um about seventeen thousand. Okay. So let's say it's worth three eighty. Let's you get a little bit of equity in there, but you're saying five years from now you definitely want to move to Colorado, and the ho- the home will probably cost five hundred thousand that you're wanting. Yes, unfortunately, yeah, that's kind of the market out there. Okay, well, I'm so, I, for some reason so, I'm more optimistic than you, Karen. I don't know why, but I think we can do this so? thing. It's just going to take more down payment. So it's not that you mm-hmm. need to have more income. Uh, I would love that for you guys, and I think you'll get there. Five years from now, you hopefully are making more than you are today. Mm-hmm. So, so the, how much debt do you have? Some of the issues, um, we've got about 30, which I, I said will be done with by the end of the year this year. Okay. And then we need the fully funded emergency fund, so that'll take a few more months after that. Yes. So um, we decided that we would be comfortable with 25000 especially living in a, a higher um, cost state Okay. for our emergency fund. Um, so we plan on having that done next year. I mean, making 130, I think you guys can pay off 30 and save up 20 in the next 12 months. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And with this yeah, new daycare, do you anticipate your income increasing significantly? No. So that will be my income with the daycare. Okay. So right now I'm just a stay at home parent, um, but I decided, you know, I want to make money. I want to do something other than just staying home, but I do want to raise my own kids mm-hmm. in those years before they go to school. And so I decided, decided that starting my own daycare at home gives me both of those opportunities. And how old are your kids right now? So right now I just have one and he is one and a half. Okay. 
And I'm, I'm taking your husband probably works like a standard nine to five. Is that correct? Um, yes. Yes. So the, the issue that we face, I think that makes us a little unique, is when we do move, he will lose his job um, because it's, it's just based here. Um, so what we're struggling with is kind of um, either deciding, do we need to move to a different state where a lower income is livable, or how can we like find a different kind of job that he would like to do? What does he do, do right now? So he flips homes. He's a realtor. He works with a partner, and they flip homes here. But they couldn't do that in Colorado? So kind of, but his partner lives here, and his partner is the one that pays his salary. Um, So it's really based on how things go and how the market is in Colorado by the time we move, whether or not his partner wants to keep paying his salary and wants to flip out there. Yeah, that feels like a lot of risk to put on the table. Could he just yeah. be a realtor in Colorado or do that on his own? Um, he could try to just be a, a regular realtor. Um, that's one of our options. Um, but we understand the, that it, we will have to change jobs or um, that's what we're kind of struggling with right now is how do we find a job that pays enough to live there um, or do we just not live there? Well, I feel like there's a lot of heaviness in your voice right now. And I actually see your situation and I'm going, the sky's the limit. You have so much ahead of you. You've got time. So if he's looking at a career change in five years, he can figure out, you know, what is the ideal career that I want? And then start working backwards and saying, what kind of training do I need? And and do it now so that in five years he's qualified for a great job. The fact that he's got home flipping experience. When you get out to Colorado and you're trying to buy a house, maybe next time you could buy a house that's a little bit cheaper and then do some fixer upper work, you know, to increase the equity pretty quickly. I mean, just hearing your story and hearing what's surrounding these decisions, I think you've got a lot of upside, a lot of great opportunity. Okay. What's your take home pay, Karen? If you're making that 130, what do you think you'd take home after taxes? Um, so like I said, I haven't started the daycare yet. Okay. Um, that'll be about next month um, that I'll open that. After um, For me, after taxes, it'll probably be about 40000 take home for me. Okay. And then for my husband, he takes home uh, about sixty five. Okay. After so taxes. we're talking, you know, 8500 bucks a month coming in. And so that means we need to get your mortgage to around, you know, $2,100. And so based on my mm-hmm. math, if you guys could put 300 down on that 500 home in Colorado five years from now, we can do this. And here's what that looks like. You said a year from now, you're debt-free with an emergency fund. That means for the next four years after that, we can begin paying down this house, house while investing 15%. And if you do, you know, 50000 a year onto that mortgage, you'll have, what, 150 ish left on the mortgage, and the home will probably be worth 450 by then, right? Um, possibly, you know, the market's all over the place right now. So we're sure. hoping that it continues to go up. Yeah. But if we just use those rough numbers for rough appreciation, you owe 150, you have the ho- the home is worth 450. You sell that. You've got about 300,000 in equity to put down on that house. And that's if your income stays at 130 for the next five years. And so you mm-hmm. absolutely can do this. Karen, do you want to move? Yes, we both want to get out of here. We know for sure we're not going to live in Utah in five years. We want to be in Colorado. Um, The thing that's hardest for us is trying to figure out, can we make it in Colorado on this plan? I mean, we we showed you on paper. Now you just got to believe it. And I think a lot of it is just the weight of this, and it just feels heavy. But I'm telling you, when you start to feel the progress, get in debt free, get the emergency fund, start paying the house down, and then look at on paper in your budget, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, we can do this. Well, we see people pay off $500,000 homes all the time. Like it is very common, even just around here in Tennessee, like houses, that's that's how much they cost. And people do it. You Absolutely. can do it. That puts this hour of The Ramsey Show in the books. Hey, it's Christina Ellis. If you love the show and want to dive deeper on your money journey, we have a weekly newsletter that gives you trending and helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for our newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter.
Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pod's moving and storage studio, it's The Ramsey Show, where America hangs out to have a conversation about your life and your money. I'm your host, George Campbell, joined this hour by best-selling author Christina Ellis, and it's a free call at 888-825-5225. If you need some help, you're at a crossroads, you need a second or third opinion, um, maybe you just need some confidence that what you're doing is the right thing. Maybe you need someone to talk you off the ledge of a terrible decision. That's one of my favorite things to do is to help you avoid some stupid tax. We are here for you, America. And Carl is kicking us kicking us off in Washington, D.C. Carl, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Awesome. How can we help um, today? Well, I have a question. I'm working on paying off my house right now. And uh, one of the things I was considering doing, I have – um, and my credit card, a little bit over $2 million points, so somewhere around $23,000 that I could get cash. Whoa. Uh, they could send me a check. So I was thinking about, yeah, I was thinking about cashing that in and then putting that towards the principal of my house. So, do, you know, what do you guys think about that? I think it's a great plan. I mean, if you already have the points, what did it take you to get 2 million points? I'm just curious. Oh, it took me a it took me a long time. Is this it a lifetime a of credit time. card spending to get two million points? Um, probably about I don't know fifteen years or something like that. Wow, in that range. Ooh, do you have yeah, any debt yeah. right now other than the house? Uh, not really. Not really. Uh-oh. No. What do you mean, not really, no. Carl? You can't leave us well, hanging no, like I that. I don't I have a credit card that I pay off every month. Okay. And um, and uh, alimony. That's about it. Okay. So, uh, yeah. what does this conversion look like to dollars? Is there any? Twenty for me. I want to say it's like twenty. Sorry, $20. speak directly into your phone, Carl. We're having we're having a hard time uh, hearing. Yes, yeah. no problem. About twenty three thousand dollars, twenty two thousand, something in that range. Absolutely. What's left on the mortgage? Uh, Four hundred and twenty six thousand. And do you have a fully funded emergency um, fund? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What's your household income? Um, it's, it's definitely, it's the six figures. It's, it's not bad. It's six figures. Okay. So you're making over a hundred thousand. Yeah. What's your goal yes. for paying off this mortgage? How many more years? I want to pay it off in five years. Love it. So that means we need to so, start attacking this thing. I mean, that's most of your income well, going yeah, towards yeah. it. So I pay every month extra. So I put, you know, I'm, I'm starting to put a thousand dollars a month extra on the, on the principal. Um, and any extra money I get, my plan is just to put it on the house. Cool. Well, I would definitely, I would cash out of all those points. And I mean, truthfully, I would stop playing their game. I think you can do way better just saving this money yourself, putting it in a high yield savings account at 4% and using that money to pay off the mortgage or just using every future paycheck and throwing at it as soon as you get it. What you're saying, take uh, take the money from the credit card and put it in a high yield savings account, or you saying? I'm saying use the money. cash out on the credit card points. But going forward, I would just use your income instead of playing the credit card game. Have you ever thought about oh, what it, okay. what the difference would be if you just cut up the cards and went, hey, how much could Carl put onto this mortgage without trying to rack up the points to eventually use 15 years down the line? Yes, yes, yes. No, you're absolutely right. The only thing is, the only reason why, the only thing I use my credit card is that I actually pay them off every month. So it's never really like I'm paying interest on the credit card. But What I, are you using the credit card uh, for? Business. Okay. Are you a business owner? Yeah. Are you self-employed? Yes. Yes, yes, I am. So what kind of expenses yeah. are you putting on the card? Anything, all the expenses as much as I can through my business on the card. And are you budgeting pretty now, well with your business? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we budget we, we budget very well, yes. Hey, Carl, I'm wondering, how's your retirement savings looking? Um, well, I'm kind of starting over. So uh, my retirement right now is as fully funded as I can get it at this point. What are you using for a retirement account? Uh, well, I have my retirement plan. Speak directly to the phone, Carl. Uh, Sorry, we're losing you again. Yeah, no problem. I have a retirement plan through work. And then I have my regular brokerage account. And then I have, um, yeah, my, my 401k. And how much do you have total saved right now? Um, 
I'm writing an essay, but I'm, I'm, I, I know it sounds crazy, but it's. Um, Are you a millionaire? It's not enough to retire. It's not. No, no, it's not enough for me to retire, though. I still got a while to go. OK, but I can only put so much. So I have to everything I can put right now. I can only put like in a brokerage account because I don't qualify for a Roth IRA. Have you looked into a solo 401k or a SEP IRA? Um, I mean, look into those. Because those have higher contribution control. limits that could help you catch up quickly if you're self-employed. Yeah, and, right. So I think the issue is really the way my structure is set up. I really can't do that. Okay. I might still get in touch with a Smart Vester Pro, Carl, at our website, RamseySolutions.com. They can walk you through what your retirement options are. The key here is I want you taking advantage of tax advantage accounts first before using the brokerage account. Um so that you can have the most money as possible in retirement. And part of that plan is awesome. You're wanting a paid for house. And by my math, if you can put 85K a year towards that mortgage, you'll have this thing paid off. And that 23K is only going to help speed that along. But I just challenge you, I just wonder if you cut up the card and you just used a debit card for your business, for your personal, how much more progress you could be making. This is a test. If you're willing to do it, call me back and let me know how it went. I had just have a dark curiosity. Well, and Carl, hang on the line. <clears throat> We're going to gift you Financial Peace University because you said with retirement savings, you're not where you want to be. You need a new plan. So this is that plan. And part of that plan is cutting up the credit cards. A lot of times when we're spending on cards, it's you spend more money and you're not as tight in the budget. And I know you said you're great with a budget, but I just challenge you to try out the plan. Like George said, give it a shot. See if it works. You said you're starting fresh. That's the best time to kind of go, hey, you know what? Let's try something new. Let's try something different. So hang on the line. Austin will get that for you. And I did some fun math for Carl. Uh, he said he's got two million credit card points, which in my mind, I'm like, that feels like you're a, you're a rich person. And he said it took 15 years of spending to get that $23,000 in cash. That's 1500 bucks a year. Now, I don't know about you, but I think most people, especially business owners, could save up more than 1500 a year and pay themselves that cash back with intentional spending, being on a budget, being diligent. And so that is my challenge to all of you out there. Add up how much you actually got. Not points. What does that actually amount to? Not a trip to Boise. What is the dollar amount you're actually getting for all of the spending and playing the credit card company's game and going, well, it's 5% on restaurants this month, so I'm going to go eat out more. Uh, that doesn't make sense, chief. That's not actually making you any money. You're spending more and they like that. And so that is my challenge to all of you. Cut up the card for six months. Just use your debit card and then call the show and let us know your findings. Maybe I'm wrong. It's a good word. I'm George. happy to be proven wrong, but I just really want to know what it's like when you spend your money and how you make decisions differently due to that. More of your calls coming up, 888-825-5225. This is The Ramsey Show. Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. Hey, if you're a new listener and you want to dive deeper into The Ramsey Plan and the baby steps, we've created a great tool for you at RamseySolutions.com. Just click on the Get Started button and we'll help you figure out the best next step for your financial journey based on exactly where you are today. Just go to RamseySolutions.com and click on Get Started. All right, Christina. So you people may have heard about this in the news. It's the Secure 2.0 bill. And there's some interesting things in there, and we're going to keep covering those things on the show to update you all on what's included. But here's an interesting one uh, that has to do with student loans and investing. Biden's mm. new retirement law means you may not have to choose between paying off student debt and saving for the future. 
Oof. It says Biden recently signed into law a new package of retirement provisions. One will allow employers to match workers' student loan payments in the form of retirement plan contributions. It's a boon for those who owe student debt, said the director of TIAA. It's the recently passed Secure 2.0 bill, which adds a set of provisions to an original retirement package implemented under the SECURE Act of 2019. Amongst other changes, the law provides workers with more retirement saving options and at the same time incentivizes workers to reenter the workforce amid a persistent structural labor uh, shortage. Uh, so they're, they're trying to lure in these young folks who maybe aren't in the workforce or they jumped out and saying, hey, uh, beginning in 2024, employee employers can match student loan payments with a matching contribution to that 401k. And they're doing this to attract those young people who have a whole bunch of student loan debt. And, uh, you know, it's another one of these benefits they're trying to use to attract them. So it's very interesting. So here's the example. Let's say I have $450 in monthly student loan payments and I'm, I got to make these payments, but I also want to invest for the future. The employer can put $450 into my 401k as a match for me while mm-hmm. I make my $450 student loan payment. Very interesting. I have, I think what stands out to me, I have so many questions about if this is supposed to bring workers back into the job market, how were they paying their student loan debt while they weren't working? That's a, Well, it's on pause, Christina. So they're all like, we're riding high. Yeah, but that's not going to last forever. Well, in their minds it is. Oh they're my hoping gosh. by the <laughs> time it's over, concern. it's forgiven and we never have to deal with it. But, uh, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of thoughts about this, but one is the frustration I would feel if you have other payments in your life or you've paid off your student loans and all of a sudden your coworker next to you who went into $100,000 for his degree is all of a sudden getting free money in his 401k because of his decision he made to go into debt. Oof. That feels frustrating. I get that I empathize with those who are struggling with student loan payments going, well, I also want to retire with dignity. But I also think it incentivizes people to hang on to their student loan payments if they're getting this free match from their employer or as even, they continue to make payments. Yeah, or even take out more student loans, maybe go back to grad school because they know that they're still going to be able to. That's the life hack. Oh, go, gosh. Go no, I'm not encouraging that. Go <laughs> $100,000 into student loan debt so you can get a free match into the 401k from your employer. Oh, gosh, no. I have mixed feelings, though, because it's like on one hand, we want people to win with money. Of course, like if people do unfortunately have student loan debt. Like I want them to be able to still build up retirement savings, but you're also right in that, like what are the long-term implications and is it ethically correct for everyone? I, you know oh. what I'd rather, I want to see this debt gone. And I think a better incentive would be for employers to match the payment yes. to help them pay off the debt. Yes, George. Now there's an Breach. idea. Breach. I should I run love for that. Congress. <laughs> hey, if George Santos can make it, I feel like I've got a shot at this point. You know, I don't think I could make up as many lies if I wanted to as him. So, <laughs> wow. Well, interesting stuff. There's a lot of interesting retirement pieces that are actually beneficial for folks who are trying to build wealth in this new Secure 2.0 Bill. So we're going to keep you guys posted on that, but just wanted to update you on that interesting uh, student debt slash investing. I'm curious to see how this plays out and just kind of the emotions. There's already so many emotions around everything Mm. student loans right now, but very emotional. I'm sure there will be debates around this. We'll be along for the ride. We're here for it. (laughs) All right, let's get to the phones. Joe is in Wisconsin. Joe, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. And thank you for taking my call. Sure. I just need well, I just need some advice on if I should pay my truck off so that I could pay my house off. Whoa. Instead of paying it off over, I think I could have it paid off by February of next year. What's left on the truck loan? Uh, 6000 And what's it worth? About 48 Wow. And what's left on the mortgage? But- 37. Oh, my goodness. This is no joke. There we go. No. So you would make a profit of 42000 selling the truck, pay off the mortgage, and still have $5,000 left over. Yeah, and I only drive like maybe a mile and a half to my job. Ooh. So I don't need like, you know, I bought the truck because I thought I needed it for my house because I always need like a truck to pick up certain things. And, you know, we have crazy winters here, but not worth it to, that's why i'm just seeing if it's worth it to do this that's incredible. Yeah, i could have the truck paid off actually by the middle of march and then the house would be paid off by 
next year early. Well, Joe, do you have any reservations? Like what would keep you from making this decision? Um, part of it is um, I do want to just get the house cut off because I do drive a LCL job. And because of the crazy winter we've had, we get a lot of shorter paychecks. What's your mortgage so I'd like payment? I'd like to have uh, 643 So you'd free that up every single month. And then what's your income? Yep. Uh, my combined income for the household between my two jobs and my wife's disability on last year's taxes was one forty one. Awesome. Man, well you're gonna get, you know, seven to eight thousand dollars back in your life every year by getting rid of this house payment and you're already making a great income. So uh And it doesn't would, sound like you're like I'm in love it. with a truck. It doesn't sound like you're super attached to it. Is Not that a, super attached to it? I mean, it's a nice truck. I mean, do you have any other debt? Yeah, it's only got seventeen thousand miles on it. It's a twenty-one Silverado. But. I'd sell it. What other debt do you have? All right. None. I just that's have the it. truck in the house, and that's it. Oh my goodness, man! It's just such a simpler life. I just love yeah. that you could be debt-free today, no payments in the world, making one forty-one. Have an extra eight grand back in your life every year. And by the way, if you want a truck in the future, you can just go pay cash for a truck in the future. Yeah, does... Right now, my truck payment's 800 because I, you know, I'm still paying and I still got like oh, a few wow. months left. So you'd on free up 800 bucks on top of the 643. Well, it's like $1,250. Dude, and then I, you just gave I, yourself a work, raise. Yeah, and if I work full time with no shortened days, I, I could think all my payments in like one and a half checks and I get paid weekly. I love this plan. It's exciting. Yeah, I think you go get debt free. And you just gave yourself a $15,000 raise by doing this one move. How does that feel? Well, that's good because then, you know, I can start putting retirement back into my retirement. Well, that puts you at baby step seven. I would start maxing out every single retirement account I can. Do you have a 401k through work? I do right now. Before I started this, I got about a quarter of a million in retirement, and I have 19 years in the military, so at the end of this year, I'll have a pension as well. Awesome. Wow. And do you have a Roth option through your employer for the 401k? I do. Cool. How old are you? I'll be 50 in about a month and a half. Okay. Joe, this is awesome. I This is a great place to be. Yeah, this is exciting. This is not only are you going to be able to get debt free this week, but I see a great trajectory ahead where it's like you're going to be able to save aggressively with that income, with the pension from the military. You're heading towards a pretty good retirement. Now, you're going to need a different car. You'll have 5000 left. Do you have any other money in the bank you could use towards a car? No, because I've been just putting everything on the truck because uh, the truck was quite expensive. So I wanted to pay it off as soon as I could. I was just pounding it all onto the truck. Do you have an emergency so fund? Have, not right now. That's what I would get because I only have $1,000 in savings and I have 2500 in my checking account because all my payments come, come okay. out on the first. Then I'm going to pause. I'm going to keep saving until I have enough in the bank to buy a used car um, so that you're in a good spot. And then once this is all done... Let's save up a fully funded emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. And then we're off to the races, back to investing. And man, what a wild journey, Joe. Woo. This is incredible. Baby Very step exciting. seven, just like that. Get rid Boom. of the truck. Oh, my goodness. So, Thanks for the call, man. This is The Ramsey Show. Scripture of the day, Proverbs 1.5. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Sidney Sheldon once said, Libraries store the energy that fuels the imagination. They open up windows to the world and inspire us to explore and achieve and contribute to improving our quality of life. 
This is The Ramsey Show. I'm George Campbell, joined by Christina Ellis. And uh, a lot of people out there think building wealth in this economy is impossible. But that is lies from hope stealers and headlines out there. You don't need to panic. You don't need to start raising your own chickens to do this thing. What you need is a plan for your money. And that's why we're heading out on the Building Wealth live tour, where we'll give you a proven plan to build wealth and keep it. We'll be in Indianapolis on February the 16th. Austin, Texas, February the 23rd. We'll be in Salt Lake City on April the 24th and rounding it out in Anaheim, California on May 2nd. Tickets start at just 49 bucks, or you can get a four-pack of tickets for $175. Bring some friends, some family. It's going to be a blast. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash events to reserve your seats for Building Wealth Live. So exciting. All right, Christina. We need an update on your no-spend month. A lot of people out there, you know, like we're, we're it's crunch time. We're in the last Woo! week of January. Yes. And a lot of people, maybe they've fallen off the wagon. Maybe they need a little pep in their step. Where are we at? Well, we've made it to the last week. And I put out a poll on Instagram last night. And I actually have a lot of people in the community that They're are still it. doing it. Good. Yes. We've almost made it, y'all. We're almost to the finish line. And what's super exciting to me is we have a lot of people who maybe didn't do it this month. They didn't prepare for it. They weren't ready for it, but they're doing it next month. Nice. Which is exciting. I had somebody reach out and say, did you know about frugal February? I'm like, ooh, I like that. Let's I like make the that sound a thing. Of that. We need to <laughs> come up with a word for every single month to where we're just on a budget every month. Hey, let's do it. If it works, then let's do it. And what's really cool is I keep getting messages from people who are making huge progress this month. They're paying off debt. They're saving in their emergency fund. They're paying down their house. And I just absolutely love it. But I do want to take a second to kind of talk about we're at the last week. What happens next, right? Because the goal, it's kind of like, have you ever done like Whole30? Uh, I've attempted it. I can't say I ever succeeded. <laughs> okay. Well, with Whole30, like the goal isn't just to do a diet for a month, right? And lose a few pounds. The goal is a lifestyle change. And same with No Spend January. It's like, it's exciting. We're seeing these quick, amazing, big wins, but we don't want it to just be this month. Like, how is it going to last throughout the rest of the year? And I know for our family, like we're already seeing ways that we can massively change the way we spend our money and do groceries. And it's been such a good tune up that I have no doubt that we're going to be doing a lot better going forward. So I just encourage all of you who've done it with us to you know, start thinking through how can we carry this progress forward? How can we carry the momentum? And one of the big things is to set a really clear goal. So for our family, you know, we want to, we're in the housing market right now, houses in our areas we've talked about are kind of crazy expensive and we want to pay it off house. So we are just aggressively saving towards the house. So my goal is by December 31st, I will put X amount of money towards paying the house, but I need it really clear and specific. So if you are in the season of being really aggressive, if you've been doing the no spend month with me, you know, really think through what's your goal that's going to carry the momentum forward. You know, maybe you'll have all your debt paid off by August or you'll build a fully funded emergency fund by June. But whatever it is, be really clear because, you know, I'm one of the things that's inspiring to me is I've had so many people in my DMs being like, I'm pumped. I'm going to do no spend February. I'm going to do it in March. We're going to do 90 days. And that is awesome. And I want you to keep that enthusiasm. It is easy for life to pop up, Murphy to show up and kind of lose that enthusiasm. But with your goal in mind, like make it clear and plain to see. And then the other thing is to create a visual. So we have this like perfect spot in our bedroom that we walk by every single day. And that is the spot for my vision board and where I'm going to put that goal like huge where I can see it. I got to, I'm forced to pass it every time I go in and out of the room. And I've been getting a lot of like trackers that people are using. Like a lot of people have like the bricks where it's like they, they have a brick for their house. And oh, like yeah. each time they like pay a thousand dollars off on their house, they like fill in a brick. And I just love that. So, you know, if it's helpful to you create a visual where it's not just like you have this goal that you can forget tomorrow, but you're seeing it every single day and you know what you fight, what you're fighting for. You feel that momentum. So I'm just super it. excited. I feel like 2023 is going to be such an awesome year and let's go y'all. Let's, let's keep go. this momentum. Get those sticky notes on the bathroom mirror, put your affirmations up there, whatever you need to do to yes. stay on track. And I'm going to work on coming up with monthly names Let's for being it. on a budget. <laughs> the best I can do for you right now is miserly March, but I don't Mis like that. It's got a very negative tone to it. We could do like money frugal. March. Yeah, that's pretty general. Though. <laughs> Momentum money. March. <laughs> Momentum March. There we go. Um, what about April? April's tough. I don't have any A words here. I'm looking at, you know, synonyms. 
affluent April. <laughs> oh, that's fancy. <laughs> right? I like that. Then we're motivating. back to M for May. Oh, this is oh, too hard. Darn. <laughs> we'll come up with it. We'll announce we'll them there. later on. We'll get there. <laughs> All right, let's get to the phones. Rachel joins us up next in New York City. Rachel, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you taking my call. Absolutely. What's going on with you? Well, I, I've i been a little bit careless. Uh, things have just been really out of control in life, and I did not even realize that I was in $4,500 of debt, which isn't much. Like, as far as the grand scheme of things, it's manageable, um, but it's over three credit cards, which I am so excited to get them paid off, closed, canceled, done with them forever. Love it. Um, but I have a question. So they're all about the same amount. I can afford to pay off within the budget. I can pay off two in full this month. The other one will have to wait until next month. I can okay. make the minimum payment, not a big deal. But one of the three has 0% interest. It is in the middle. It's like the second most amount of money. Would it be fair of me to push that one to next month and pay the two off that have interest rates? What are the balances? You know that, um, they're ranging between 1200 and 1500 Hey, Rachel, can we back up for just a second? How did you, yeah. how did you accidentally get in $4,500 of credit card debt without knowing it? So I like was aware that I was using my credit cards, but I didn't realize what the balance was. I'd just been very, very careless. I'm paying stupid tax, as Dave would say, um, for for being careless in the months leading up to my wedding. Have you pay, have you cut up those credit cards? I have. Okay. Good. I've cut them up. I've put them in a frame on my desk. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Good. That's the level of anger we needed. <laughs> there we go. I feel better now. Now we can proceed. I'm going to no, pay I'm these committed. off from smallest to largest and ignore that 0% interest rate because I think it's one of okay. those mental traps that got us here in the first place. And I like the feeling of still having that one with interest dangling out there to keep the fire under you to get rid of it as soon as possible. That's I I kind of thought that's what you'd say, but I wanted to I wanted to make sure I was doing it the right way. That's what um, I would do because I'm a human and I'm I know I'm not perfect, and I know when I see zero percent, I go. Eh, I got time. I next got month's space. fine too, though. I mean, it'll it'll we'll get rid of it. I love the idea of you looking at 22% interest going, I will never do business with any of these scummy companies again. That's what the feeling I want you to have. Yeah, pay all the stupid tax. (laughs) It's wonderful having them cut up and sitting on my desk and being like, I will be done with them in two months. In two months, I will be completely out of debt and it won't be a problem. I love it. When's the wedding? Uh, The wedding was in December. Oh. So I'm like... Now recovering and looking at everything, and we're you know creating our budget together and all of that good stuff. So I love it. So I, is your spouse on board with this crazy plan? Oh yeah, that's great. That's great. Have you guys been through Financial Peace University? We have. Nice. Love well, it. hey, we, we all as, we all pay our stupid tax, I, Rachel. So don't feel shame and guilt. We just learn and move on. It's only really stupid if you keep doing it exactly and keep justifying it but i'm glad it's in the frame it's in the rear view mirror and within the next month no more debt and you're going to have that emergency fund real soon and you're going to be building for the the, future instead of paying for the past we have our thousand dollar emergency fund and we had built up an emergency fund before the wedding between like on our own and that's what we're using to to clear these cards awesome i love it man young people getting this stuff newlyweds it just warms my heart what a beautiful story love it congrats on soon to be debt freedom rachel this is the ramsey show Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. I'm George Campbell, joined by Christina Ellis. 
and we are excited to take your calls, America, to help you take that right next step in your financial journey. And Harry is on the line in Detroit. Harry, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Well, hi, you guys. Thanks for taking my call very much. Um, Absolutely. I've got a friend who's in a real dire situation, and he's and he never had problems with money before auto pay. He never had an overdraft before auto pay. He t- paid his bills manually. Since auto pay, he has had just ridiculous problems with it. And uh, and not only do I feel for him, I'm quite scared for myself as well. I'm I have I'm great with money. Haven't had an overdraft in 24 years myself, and I pay my bills on time manually. But they are trying to get me to switch over to auto pay. I'm not going to do it. I'm holding out as long as I can. How do you deal with auto pay and this kind of problem? What what exactly like what is the problem? Like he's not okay. timing it well, or what's what's been the issue? They pull it out whenever they want. If it, they pull it out, sometimes on the 15th or 18th or 10th or whatever. Uh, if they pull everything out the same day, my friend, it'd be all right. But he's, that's the problem that they've had. They've pulled things out. They even double bill people sometimes, these people. Who, oh. Who's they? Is it the bank? Is it the the, like the utility provider? Who's they in this? It's, yeah, it's, it's the different companies that they, um, that he's had. And so I don't know how to help him. <laughs> And I don't even know how to help me because I'm afraid it could happen to me in the future. Well, here's what I do, Harry, and this is anecdotal. I've got my all of my utility bills, most of everything I can get on auto pay, I do it. But here's what I also do. I do a monthly budget and I mark due dates. Mm-hmm. And inside of every dollar, you can mark the due dates for those bills so I know exactly when they're coming out. And we also have a new tool inside of every dollar premium called paycheck planning, where it will show you exactly when you would run out of money. So it would show your friend when he would overdraft based on when his bills come out. And what you can do is call the company or get on their website and you can change the due date to a very specific date. And uh, then you can plan for that in your budget. So if you need that bill to come out on the 16th because you get paid on the 15th instead of the 10th, you can move that generally uh, to the 16th to avoid that. And you start doing that with enough bills and use that paycheck planning tool and you can solve all these problems. I truly do not think it's auto pay is the enemy. I think it is ourselves. And that's a hard pill to swallow to go. I haven't done a good job managing my bills and my money. And also another thing he needs is a buffer in his checking account. And so instead of budgeting from $0 in his bank, he needs to have a $200, $300 buffer sitting in there. And that's kind of the floor. We don't go below $300. Every bit of our income and expenses happens beyond that $300. Another thing you can do is turn off overdraft to where the bill just won't go through and you won't get charged. Oh, that's right. So you could go into your banking features and turn that function off so that you don't get dinged from the bank. And I've done this before, Harry. Uh, You know, even in the past few years, we miscalculated something and I got the overdraft fee and nothing makes me angrier than an overdraft fee of $35. So I walk into the bank and I go, listen, I've been a customer for a decade. I'm willing to stop today because of this overdraft fee. And they go, all right, as a one-time courtesy, we'll refund you the $35. So you can also get that overdraft fee ba- uh, back if your bank is nice. How's okay, that sound, Harry? The other thing is, all right, yeah. Um, the other thing is I was going to do that myself with uh, a utility um, because I wanted to switch my payment uh, to the third. And I called them and they said, well, if you switch to the third, you're going to have a fee uh, every month because uh, we, you're paying it on the 3rd instead of when we want you to pay it. When do they want you to pay it? On the 26th. I've never heard the that. previous month. Do you know if it's no, a fee or are they trying to just like make up the difference, like a prorated amount to kind of change the date? Is it an actual like dinging nope. you a penalty? It's an actual fee. It's Yeah, it's an actual fee. I couldn't believe it. Is this oh, a well. – <laughs> which utility provider is it? Verizon. Okay. Um – I would maybe try calling so back I and trying. It. Well, if that's the case, the I'm going to adjust. Well, well. I'm going to go, well, I'm going to have the money on the 26th, and I'm going to gift you every dollar premium. Uh, I'll give you two of them. How about that? One for you and one for your friend, and you guys can have a little budget party together. How's that sound? Well, I can't see to use your software, but my friend would love it, I'm sure. Okay. We'll make sure to get that over to you. Austin will pick up, and we'll get that over to you. But it's a it's an interesting conversation, Christine. It is an interesting conversation, and I do know a lot of that stuff can be kind of overwhelming. Like, I don't know how, how tech-savvy 
Harry is, but I know for my mom, it's a lot like trying to be like, mom, just change it to where this is on this day and then go to the bank and do this. And then it, sitting down with her is really helpful. So if there's somebody in your life, if you feel overwhelmed by trying to get everything set up, maybe I know it can be a tough pill to swallow sometimes for parents, but millennials and Gen Z, we're pretty good at tech. We're <laughs> like just, hip with it. <laughs> we're hip with it. And I feel like we're at the spot now with my mom, with my husband's parents. Like that's kind of our role. We sit down with them and we walk them through like, how do we set up things on the right schedule? How do we deal with the technology? It can feel kind of overwhelming, but like walking through it. Oh yeah. That's a good call. Love that. All right. Let's go to Ashley in Chattanooga. Ashley, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? We're doing great. How can we help today? Um, I am just struggling trying to find um, the right communication um, to um, set up finances. And, you know, my boyfriend and I are considering um, moving forward and proposing and getting married. And we just have different views of finances. And so I'm just trying to to get him on board with savings and what are his uh, where views? we're allocating our money. Um, he doesn't really have any. <laughs> um, it's kind of frustrating. Every time I talk about it, he just um, kind of shuts down. I mean, I just recently found out kind of how much money he has in the bank, how much money he makes, and we've been together for um, almost three years. So it's just kind Is it of disconcerting? A, to Like, does he have a lot of money in the bank or does he have nothing? Um, I, he has well more than I do. Um, and I think that he, you know, from the way his family is, I think he's, he's grown up a little bit more comfortable than my family, as in like, he has never had to worry about having money. Whereas I have always had a job and always kind of lived paycheck to paycheck until I got my career job. Um, so, and we're both making the most that we've ever made, um, in our careers. So I just, I don't know how to ask him, you know, with him making almost double my salary, I think that it's kind of, I don't really know the wording. Um, What's the fear on your part? What's the fear um, that he, that we're just, we're blowing money. We're not on a but He doesn't. So you're saying he's been out earning his stupidity. He's just kind of doing whatever he wants because he makes enough that it's not really a concern. Is he going into debt for all this? No, no, he's great. Um, That's why I, I feel bad even asking. I own a home, so I own my own home. Um, He doesn't own a home. He lives with me. So I think that was the first miscommunication or the first. uh, How does that work? Is he paying you rent? Yes, but is that wrong? I don't know. I don't don't know how. So what are not married? I don't. (laughs) What do these conversations look like? Like whenever you try to sit him down and speak about money, what does it look like? What does he get defensive? Does he get aloof? You said he shuts down. At what point does that happen? Um, it happened right around my dog in the other room. Um, he just doesn't, he's never open to the conversation. I always have to start it and he just kind of shakes his head and doesn't. Is he, do you think he's controlling with it? He doesn't want anyone to tell him what to do with his money? Yes. Yes. And how do you, how do you start the conversations? Like how is this opener to the financial conversation? Um, so, you know, there's stuff at the house that he doesn't uh, love my house. And I, and, you know, it's just my first home and I feel um, pretty proud of it. You but, should be, Ashley. Yeah. You tell him to um, kick rocks and pound sand if he doesn't want to live there. And it's part of the reason I this mean, is so messy is because when you shack up and play house, it usually doesn't end well. And so we need to have some really hard conversations with this guy and say, listen, I can see a future with you, but not if we don't align on this money stuff and not if you're not willing to talk about it. And I would also suggest premarital counseling because it sounds like there may be some deeper issues. The fact that he's willing to say those sort of things that kind of brings shame to your housing situation that you're really proud of. I'd really dig into those roots before you marry this guy. Absolutely. I mean, money fights and money problems are one of the leading causes of divorce. And so I would tread lightly with this guy. I hope the best for you. I would go through Financial Peace University. I would gift that to you guys right now. So hang on the line. Austin will pick up. If he's unwilling to go through Financial Peace, it's a big red flag to me. And I would pause with this relationship and it might mean it's time to kick this guy out. Thanks for the call, Ashley. That puts this hour of The Ramsey Show in the books. My thanks to Christina Ellis and you, America. 
Hey, it's George Camel. If you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the Ramsey Baby Steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click on the Get Started button. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation. That's RamseySolutions.com and click Get Started.